And this teaching or this text has two main themes. One is how the Buddha wants to leave his teachings as guidance to practice for the community and people who are following him to empower them. And the second is to foster or empower wise relationships to one another in the spiritual community and to the world. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. I want to give a talk or teachings following one of the great Buddhist texts, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which is a teaching on the last year, the story of the last year of the Buddhist life. And when you look at the Buddhist texts, they're full of stories, encounters with people who come to see the Buddha seeking understanding or relief from suffering or healing or um, philosophers and yogis trying to understand the mind. And he meets them all and gives each one an individual instruction, sometimes mindfulness training, sometimes compassion, sometimes uh, a wisdom, sometimes the training in virtue and ethics, sometimes the training in how to tend one's body and heart, all of these trainings. And in this particular text that we will go through tonight is one of my favorite teachings. I've done it, no. Oh, Every three or four years for quite a while, I'll return to these teachings because I find them inspiring. And they're meant to really be examined as a kind of experiment for yourself, reflecting how does this affect me or point to something important in my own life. And I'm going to do it in a particularly unusual way in that I want to speak of these teachings, describe them, not as history, because it's a sort of historical account of his last year, but that's kind of boring. Okay, I went there, I did this, you know, here's my, uh, my homework, what I did last summer, or what I did on my last year. But as a myth, as part of one of the greatest myths of humankind, which is the myth of the Buddha you know, leaving the princely life and becoming an ascetic and then sitting under the tree of enlightenment and then discovering, awakening and teaching people and going back to his own family and and all around India on foot for 45 years. The myth of the Buddha or the story of it is a story of what's possible for us. And the reason I want to teach it in a mythological terms, is you'll hear it sounds that way. It begins with the text that says, thus I have heard, which is a little bit like once upon a time. And it ends with the phrase, this is how it was in the old days. And so you can settle back and listen to this story that speaks from an ancient heart that's timeless to your own. And this teaching or this text has two main themes. One is how the Buddha wants to leave his teachings as guidance to practice for the community and people who are following him to empower them. And the second is to foster or empower wise relationships to one another in the spiritual community and to the world. And the setting for this teaching or this myth is Vulture's Peak, already a kind of mythological word, a mountain in northern India that sticks up from the plains of India near the province, current modern province of Bihar, 
that used to be covered with great forests and huge trees and wild animals. Now it's become deforested and more desert land and poorer soils. But then it was it was verdant and fecund and filled with life. And that's where the monks and nuns and followers of the Buddha and others who lived there along the plain of the Ganges heard these teachings. And it offers this empowerment and these teachings. It does this by setting up the image of a kingdom of justice and compassion and respect. How should we continue to practice when you, the Buddha, have gone? And he's preparing people for the end of his life. It begins with a dialogue where the minister from the king of Magadha, one of the local kingdoms, comes to see the Buddha and says, should we make war on the Bajians? There is the possibility of conflict that's building up. And should we, should we engage in war? Should we back off? What should we do? And instead of giving them advice of whether they should engage in war or not, the Buddha, in his usual way, starts to have them inquire deeply. And he says, tell me, do the Vajians meet together in harmony, listen to one another and respectfully, and depart in harmony? And the minister says, yes, they do. And the Buddha said, then they can be expected to prosper and not decline. Tell me, do the Vajians protect those who are vulnerable among them, the children, the women, the elderly, the sick? And the minister says, yes, they do. And the Buddha says, then they can be expected to prosper and not decline. And then he says, tell me, do the Vajians stay true to the ancient teachings of living with virtue and understanding and cultivating the heart? And the minister said, yes, they do. Then they can be expected to prosper, not decline. Tell me, do these Vajians take care of the nature shrines and of the environment in which they live as a sacred place? Yes, they do, said the minister. And then the Buddha said, then they can be expected to prosper and not decline. And so the minister left going back to his king saying, hey, the Buddha said these Vajians are doing all the things that make them strong and help them prosper and make a beautiful society. Listening to each other in harmony, I wish we were doing that more in our current time. Respecting the vulnerable, taking care of the natural environment, following the teachings, the deep teachings of wisdom. So this is how the Buddha responds. And then he goes on and he says, so to you, monks, so to you, nuns, so to you, the lay followers, you should follow in their footsteps and you should cultivate listening to each other with respect and harmony, taking care of the vulnerable among you, sustaining the natural world around you, preserving your own personal mindfulness, and thus you too will prosper and not decline. As long as the monks and nuns, both in public and in private, show loving kindness to their companions through acts of body, speech, and thought, and share their virtuous actions with one another, so long will they prosper and not decline. For this, he goes on, is the basis for the freedom of heart, for liberation. So this is kind of how it starts, by setting up what a wise kingdom looks like, both among the Vajians and for us as well at this time. What would a wise society look like to listen deeply as we do care for the vulnerable in the environment? But here's my question for you. If we take this as a myth and not just history, why didn't the Buddha say you shouldn't go to war against the Vajians? You know, they might defeat you or they can't be defeated. 
reflect for a moment. Why didn't he do that? And one of the things that's important to hear in this is that instead of saying do this or do that, the Buddha is pointing to the underlying causes, not just the effects of things, but to see if we live in a certain way, what will be the outcome? He wants people who are listening to him, those who are seeking wisdom, to inquire in themselves, what is it that makes a wise society? What gives strength and courage? And to see the causes rather than a simple answer. Then the rest of this long text of many, many pages, this sutra, is the gist of his travels, the announcement of his death, the last disciples, the last teachings, what he wants people to keep in mind and follow, his last meal and what happens at his death. Here are some of the stories. At this point, then, he wanders with a company of renunciates and lay followers from Vulture's Peak. And he goes to Pavarika's mango grove near Nalanda. And there, as he's seated quietly, his chief disciple, the wisest of them, Sariputra, comes up to him and looks at him with great admiration and says, there will never be a better, never be a more enlightened teacher than you, O oh master, speaking to the Buddha. And the Buddha raises his eyebrows and looks back at Sariputra, wise though he's supposed to be, and says, do you know the other Buddhas from the other eras? No, said Sariputra. Do you know the ones from the past? No. Do you know the ones in the future? No. Do you know the extent of the Buddha's mind sitting in front of you? No, sir. Then how can you say such a thing? And Sariputta responds. He said to the Blessed One, just as if there were a great city and it was surrounded by a mighty wall and there was an entrance, one entrance gate into the city. And at the entrance gate, there stood someone who was watchful and caring compassionate and strong, courageous, who noticed what wanted to come into the city or who and what was leaving and could discern this is for the benefit of those living in this place and this is not for the benefit. In the same way, said Sariputta, the awakened ones of all the eras and all the times Rest at the gateway of mindfulness and notice as thoughts come and go, as experiences rise and pass, as people and interactions happen, they quiet themselves. And as if standing at the gate, they receive all of this with discernment and loving awareness, with mindfulness. And in so doing so, they allow that which is healthy into themselves and that which is not, they do not. Rumi writes this poem, what, of what use is it to make such a fuss when we will soon enough all go through that same gate? And of course, he's speaking of the gate of the end of life. But this is a beautiful teaching because here Sariputta answers, all right, I don't know the Buddhists of the past and present, but I know the nature of liberation itself. When we rest in the present and can notice what arises and with discernment see this is healthy and this is unhealthy. And with that discernment, follow. That is the gateway to our freedom and to our liberation. And then as they wander further, they go along the banks of the Ganges River. And the Buddha and those following take a seat at some point. And the Buddha says, so tell me, those of you who are practicing to cross the flood of sorrow, tell me when you get to the other side, what will you do with the raft of your teachings? He said, these teachings are a raft 
to cross over, to make a bridge, to help you across the flood of confusion and difficulty by establishing mindfulness, by establishing concentration and stillness and steadiness, by establishing integrity. These become your raft. But when you cross the flooded Ganges, then what do you do with the raft? Do you carry it around with you? And of course, the disciples being wise said, no, we don't, sir. No, we don't. And the Buddha said, just so. These are teachings to use. These are teachings to guide you. But they're not teachings to carry. They're simply used to cross over the moments and days of confusion or fear to have these teachings to cross over into the peace of liberation, which you can do in a moment. And then you leave the teachings aside. So then as the story goes along, the blessed one continued. And he sat to rest under a great tree in the forest and asked to be alone to meditate. And as he did, Mara, who in this language in that time is the incarnation of ignorance, greed, hatred, sometimes translated as the evil one, although I don't think evil is quite the right language for Mara, but certainly the opposite of enlightenment. And as you all know, in the great story of the Buddha's awakening under the Bodhi tree, Mara came and tried to tempt him with his beautiful daughters and every possible desire. And the Buddha just sat there and said, I see you, Mara. And then Mara threw flaming arrows and spears at the Buddha and he touched them with his fingers and heart of compassion and they turned to flower petals at his feet. And then Mara tried doubts and who do you think you are to sit in this way? You don't even know what's possible. And then the goddess of the earth rose up and swept away Mara saying, this human being has sat and established the basis of liberation in his own heart for so long. He does understand. Well, it turns out Mara keeps coming back. You may have noticed this in your own life. You go to a retreat, you do your own meditation, things seem hunky-dory, everything is fine. You're in a great place. And then who comes knocking? Mara reappears. And the thing is, if you read in these texts, Mara comes back 40 times in the texts during the Buddha's life. When he has a backache or where things are difficult in his community um, or struggles or things like that, then Mara appears. And this is because Mara, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, no Mara, no Buddha. That actually the Buddha and Mara are inter inter our without Mara, the Buddha wouldn't have something to awaken from. And we all carry this in ourselves. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian writer and act, peace activist said, if only there were evil people out there insidiously committing evil deeds and it were simply necessary to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who among us is willing to destroy a piece of our own heart? So Mara will appear for you as he does to the Buddha over and over in this story. And each time Mara appears, the Buddha says, is that you, Mara? And then in this case, Mara says, I've come to see you many times and said, it's time for you to quit your teaching. You should retire. You should end your life. You've done what you want. And you always said, I need to have a, a great community of people. I need to benefit people and have them benefit one another. And only then can I take final nirvana. And Mara said, now you've done this. It's time for you to let go. And the Buddha reflects and he says, yes, Mara, 
Later this year, I will take my final nirvana. Now, why does Mara keep coming? You'd think there's happily ever after enlightenment, wouldn't you? But it's not like that. The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And Mara is part of the myth and part of human incarnation of our dance. Mara has been visiting you and every time you meditate, you might get quiet for a little bit and then Mara comes. Doesn't matter, you know, if you're in Des Moines or you're in, you know, Florida or you're in Belfast, Ireland, Mara will find you and say, oh, and then you can say, oh, yes, doubt, fear, confusion. Is that you, Mara? And the minute you can acknowledge it and say, oh, Mara, I know you, then Mara loses his power. So as soon as the Buddha said to Mara, yes, finally, I will end my dispensation or I will end and my teaching, this year I will pass into final nirvana. There was a great earthquake, a terrible hair-raising earthquake and thunder, and Ananda, his attendant, came running and said, what is the cause of this great earthquake? And the Buddha explained, there are great earthquakes because of the movement of the earth, but there are also earthquakes when a Buddha is conceived. And when he's born or she's born and when he's enlightened and when he first turns the wheel of the Dharma and when he renounces his teaching. But why the image of an earthquake? Reflect. Because it's the shaking of the foundation of all the ground that we stand on. The enlightenment the teachings of birth and death, the earthquake says this is what awakens us from the dream of separateness and solidity. There's something greater here in our human incarnation. Who are you really? Remember, you are consciousness itself born into this body. You're the witness to it all. And the earthquake reminds you of this. And then Ananda weeps and begs and says, please stay. Many times you've told me that you could live a long, long, long time. Please don't die. And the Buddha replies, I gave you hints that I could stay a long time, but you never asked me until this moment. I gave you hints that if you told me three times I must stay for a long time, I could do so. And these hints I told you at the black snake pool and at Jivika's mango grove and at the deer park in Rajgir and the cool wood in Tapoda. And each time you could have said, please stay and live long and long, but you did not. So yours is the fault, Ananda. Whoa, how about your teacher saying that at the end of his life or her life? Yours is the fault. Now talk about a serious guilt trip, right? Yours is the failure for not asking Ananda. And then he went on. Now my body is old, like an old cart held together by straps and thongs. And you have not asked me to stay. So this year I will take my final nirvana. How can we understand this? Why would the Buddha say this to his most beloved attendant, his cousin, the person that everybody respected? And he says, it's your fault, Ananda. Reflect for a moment. What could this mean? Yes, his body's like an old cart, and that's what happens to our bodies. But there's something deeper in this. He's trying to say that the teacher-student relationship is not one way. That everyone that you relate to, those who are your teachers, and everyone becomes your teacher in some way, but especially where you receive important teachings, is a two-way responsibility. 
You have to listen and tend and be caring as they do. It is an interdependent relationship. And thus it is your responsibility to be in that relationship and offer yourself as that other person, the wise one, the teacher, or the person you're learning from does too. Now, it's also true that later when the Buddha, just before the Buddha dies, he praises Ananda, as he's done often in these texts, for his care and beauty and how pleasant he is for everyone who's come to see the Buddha, how he tends them well, you know, the qualities of his timing and sensitivity. He loves Ananda, and it's a very clear relationship. But this is a moment where he's saying, this is a two-way deal, Ananda, and you and I have to take care of each other. If you want to wake, awaken, this is what you too need to remember. Then it goes along in another scene, in the Buddha and the gathering of renunciates and lay followers leave and go along the Ganges River, and he offers teachings to the large company of followers. And each time he completes these teachings, when he's done, he sits quietly those who receive these teachings. And the last phrase he offers is this. Now it is time for you to go and do as you see fit. Why would he say this each time someone comes with questions? He gives a response. Somebody asks for a teaching on mindfulness, compassion, or forgiveness. He gives the teachings. And then he says, now it is time for you to go and do as you see fit. What does this mean? What it points to is that the teacher cannot do it for you. No one can enlighten, get enlightened for you. You know, no one can love for you. No one can forgive for you. No one can awaken for you. No one can let go for you. So the Buddha offers his pointings, his teachings, his skillful means, his medicine. And then he says, it's in your good hands. Now it is time for you to do as you see fit. And there's a beautiful empowerment in this that we can take in our lives in all of our interactions with those that we care about, because often it was people you really cared about, it's now in your good hands. And that allows you to be peaceful and steady and caring, but not attached or grasping to the outcome. And then Ananda and the senior monks and nuns with the Buddha says, so once you are gone, who will be our guide? Great question. When you don't have the great teacher with you. And the Buddha put no one in charge of the Sangha. He didn't say, all right, now I deputize Sariputta or Nanda, whoever it is. They will be the new, you know, next Buddha to take over the community. He said the truth will be your guide. Be an island unto yourself. Let the Dharma teachings and the teachings of ethics and virtue, let them be your guide. And they said, how shall these be our guide? How can we know? They responded, what are the real teachings of the Buddha? And he said, there are four ways to know, because he liked to make lists. You heard it from the lips of the Blessed one, you heard it from the circle of elders. You learned it as a respected teachings. Some masters had repeated, should you follow these? Should you approve or not approve? He said, only 
Only if you consider in your own heart, does this conform to the gist of the Dharma teachings that you heard? Does it have a basis in virtue and ethics, not harming oneself and others? Then it is the path of liberation. Does it have a basis in samadhi and quieting the mind and looking deeply and listening? then it is a path to liberation. Does it have a basis in wisdom, in seeing clearly? Then it is the teaching of the Blessed One. Does it follow the Four Noble Truths? That there is suffering, that it acknowledges suffering, that it sees the causes, greed, hatred, and ignorance, that it offers the path of mindfulness, compassion, and wisdom to the end of suffering. If it does, then it is the teachings of the Blessed One. And he went from place to place offering these fundamental teachings, the Four Noble Truths, the foundations of mindfulness, of loving awareness of the body, of feelings, of the play of the mind, and of our relations with one another and establishing ourselves in mindful, loving awareness. Then we begin to partake in the consciousness, in the mind, in the heart of liberation. We share that with the Blessed One. Now the Buddha continues to wander. This is again an account of the whole last year. And he comes to rest and practice in a large and beautiful forest grove. It described the travel becoming diff difficult for him. His body is getting sicker now, yet his heart is at peace. And in this forest grove, he becomes surrounded by, the word goes out, this may be the Buddha's last year of teaching, and 500 or 1,000, they use these numbers, 1,000 or 10,000, renunciates and monastics and devoted lay people come. And there they are in the forest. And then visiting dignitaries and yogis and people who hear about the Buddha come for teachings. And here you see the Buddha in this part of the story, seated in the midst of this great following, and in the distance, a retinue of the best carriages arrive, and the courtesan Ambapali comes dressed in her finest silks with a whole coterie of young and beautiful women and their attendants in their finest silks and perfumes, and they seated themselves near the Blessed One and bowed and paid their respect, respects, walking into the grove step by step with a, with a gesture of, of respect. And when they did, it says the Buddha instructed and inspired and roused and awakened them and taught them the four foundations of mindfulness, the gateways of liberation, and taught them about dignity of virtue and living with integrity. And as they sat to the side of the Buddha and listened deeply, there awakened in them a sense of freedom, the shift of identity from confusion and misunderstanding to realize that they could step back and be the loving witness of it all, not caught in their reactivity, not caught in separateness. And great delight arose in them. And then Ambapali, in response, invited the Buddha and a company of 500 of his followers in a formal invitation to come and take a meal at her palace. The Buddha accepted. And then an interesting thing happened. They were still seated here, and a whole new group of carriages came. You can tell how mythological this is. It's kind of wonderful. And these were the nobles 
the Lichavis of the local kingdom there of the, the great city nearby. And they came and they heard the last of the Buddha's teachings and he also roused them when they sat and paid their attention. They arrived dressed in blue and yellow and white, it says, with great silks and adornment and royal carts and horses and elephants. And they came and it was their turn. And then they invited the Buddha to take a meal, which was the great way of making merit of saying, if we can offer something to you, you give us these amazing teachings and we now want to, have this relationship where we support you and your followers who want to make the deepest of all merit, you know, of caring for the blessed one. And the Buddha said, um, I'm sorry, I cannot accept your invitation. I've already received an invitation from the courtesan Ambapali, who's sitting over there with her retinue. And they got really upset. You accepted the invitation? From that mango woman, you know, it was sort of the slang and the slur for her, for being a courtesan. And they went over and they said to her, and the Buddha said, I accept. I accepted her invitation. And they got so upset and they went over to her and they said, we want to, we want to make an offering and a meal for the blessed one while he's here. And she shook her head and they said, we will give you a hundred thousand gold pieces. And Ambapali, whose heart had just awakened in the presence of the Buddha, said, not for a whole kingdom would I give her up the chance to make an offering to the Blessed One, because that was the source of her own awakening. And they went back and they asked the Buddha again, and he said, I have accepted. Dear friends, she was first. So why does the courtesan appear here in, in, the, in the myth, in the story? Reflect for a moment. It's really a beautiful teachings about who can practice and who's worthy of liberation and what are the deepest values of the Dharma. And these values say that not by caste or creed, not by race or birth, said the Buddha, does one become noble. But one becomes noble by the state of one's heart. A truly radical teaching in a society that, that at that time the Brahmin and Hindu structure was all about caste and who is above the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas and the, the different levels of, of the castes. the Shudras, the untouchables. And he said, no, nobly born you who have the great heart that's possible of awakening. Each of you, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And he turned no one away. He saw the nobility of every human being. And so Ambapali really stands in for all the rest of us. For those who are wounded, those who have been cast aside in the culture, those who are insecure, all the ways we think we're not worthy. And the Buddha says, yes, you are worthy. You, human being, you come. And if you come with your sincerity, the Dharma gates will open for you and will bless you. And then, as the story goes on, the last meal is offered to the Buddha at Pava Manga Forest. And as the meal is offered, the Buddha says, this part portion is for me, no one else eat. And Pava offered the best hard and soft foods. But it turns out that this last meal depending how, what story you read of it, that there was something that had gone bad in the food, in the part that the Buddha took. 
And he kind of knew it. He was already sick a lot that year. And he took this meal anyway, for whatever reason, perhaps because he knew finally it was his time. And it was offered with so much sincerity. He ate it and shortly thereafter described having pains like a knife cutting into his abdomen. That's how sick the dysentery became and the difficulty. But even as he started to feel sick, he looked at Kunda the Smith and he said, thank you for offering this last meal. It is one of the most important offerings that a Buddha receives in his life. And you will make great blessings from this. Now, why would he say this? Here you're giving the meal and the Buddha dies not long after that. Doesn't seem like a very good thing. But what happened when you reflect on this is that the Buddha pointed to the purity of Kunda the Smith's intention. The key to karma is your motivation. And this was offered with such a pure heart and so much goodness that the Buddha said it is your pure heart and your goodness that in the end will bear fruit. And you can feel this in your own life, even though it doesn't bear fruit right away, when you act out of truth, out of your deepest values, out of what you care about the most, and there's a purity and integrity in it, it not only feels right to you, but it makes the karma sows the seeds of liberation and well-being and flowering. And then he sits after this, he's taken to a nearby forest glade and sits by a stream and closes his eyes and goes into a deep meditation. And he, when he wakes up, a man named Bakusa walks by. And the Buddha says, I am thirsty. And Bakusa says, I will get you water from the river, but some carts have crossed this river while you were meditating. Did you not see them? And the Buddha said, I did not. The blessed one was in another place, which was the state of deep samadhi. He said, and even if 500 carts had passed in that state, timeless and transcendent, I would not have heard them. And this is the state that is never born and never dies. The Buddha was seated there in the timeless realm of awareness itself. Consciousness that creates all things. And then you return to the incarnation of being the blessed one, the Buddha, Gautama. And Pakusa said, I cannot get you water from the river. It's all stirred up. And the Buddha said, please bring me. And he brought the water in a container and the Buddha held it in its hand. And, and it all got clear and purified like you would put alum into a glass or a container with mud and so forth, and it would all settle to the bottom. And again, this is a beautiful image of the Buddha's own mind and heart, saying, you can bring me that which is muddy, and when I hold it in loving awareness and in the awakened consciousness that we are, it all settles and become clear. And then Pakusa said, let me offer the Blessed One some robes for this last part of your journey. And he gave him these robes of burnished gold cloth. And as the Buddha put the robes on, the gold cloth faded into the background and his own skin began to glow golden and brighter than the robes. What is this? The Buddha glowing in gold, the gold robes. Why is this in the story? Gold is a symbol of that which does not tarnish. No matter what happens, gold will not tarnish. It holds its royal beauty. 
And so these robes and the glow of the Buddha was that which is untarnished by the arising and passing of all things. And here, says Pakusa, the blessed one who began to speak has roused and inspired us all, has set up what is, that which has been knocked down, has pointed to the way to one who's lost, who's carried a lamp into the dark places of the world so that those with eyes to see can see and those with a heart to open can know that which is unborn, the timeless, the reality beyond our individual separateness, the freedom that we were born to. This is the Dharma body of the Buddha. And there was a very wonderful text at one point earlier on, a man who was deeply devoted and inspired by the Buddha and used to sit there and go and follow him around and gaze at him because the Buddha was said to have been a handsome man and a handsome prince and a, you know, uh, a beacon of compassion and love and wisdom. And he would just stare at him. And after some weeks or months, some long time, the Buddha looked at this disciple and said, why do you keep staring at me? Knowing exactly the answer. And he said, oh, I love to look at the blessed one, to hear your words. I see you. You're so magnificent. You're so inspiring. And the Buddha replied, you do not see me. You only see this outer form, this body, these robes. That's not who I am. And the man paused and said, then how might I see you? And the Buddha replied, one who sees the depth of the Dharma, that is one who sees the awakened one. So that in any moment, when you step out of the separate sense, the small sense of self, the separate body, sometimes called the body of fear, and feel first the interdependence with all that lives, and then beyond that, the consciousness is what you really are, timeless, unborn, awakened, free. Then you see the Buddha, you know the Buddha. So after this, with Pakukasa's golden robes, the Buddha can barely move, but he goes along with great pains and severe bloody sickness. This is saying human nature. This is what happens in a human incarnation, in a human form. It's not something to be avoided by us. Birth, growing up, aging, Sickness, death, part of the first noble truth. This is the nature of incarnation. It's not bad. It's simply the way things are. Trees, especially deciduous trees, have their leaves in the summer. And then the fall comes and they drop their leaves and there's snow in the winter. Everything has its cycle. And this is the nature of incarnate life. And so here's the magnificent blessed one, the Buddha, with great pains and severe bloody sickness. So he lay down in the lion's pose on his right side, if you want to sleep like the Buddha, lie on your right side, between two sal trees. And as he lay there, it says, the trees immediately bloomed full of blossoms. And then with those who had the eyes to see, the great yogis who could look beyond this dimension to others, the atmosphere became filled with angels and devas, the devas of great purity and the radiant ones and the devas of great peace and the devas of magnificent beauty and the devas of boundless compassion. They all appeared surrounding the Buddha And the Buddha said to those standing near him, move aside a little bit so that the angels and the unseen beings can also have their place to see the blessed one. And resting there, quite sick, still with the trees blooming and Ananda tending him, 
Ananda said, do not die here. Do not die. Why don't you go from here into Kosala or Benares, Varanasi, to one of the great cities, to a palace where you can be honored or the banks of the Ganges? Don't die in this miserable backwater in what the texts call a daub and waddle village, which is an old anthropological term, probably somewhat colonial, partly mixed of old English and maybe from Australian as well, of those huts that are made of little staves of bamboo and mud. Don't die here. Go to some magnificent place that you should then go and we can celebrate your passing. The Buddha pauses and says, do not call this a miserable backwater. Once upon a time long ago, and here we are again in the myth of this story, as we come toward the end, he said, on this very spot, an eon ago, there was a king named Mahasudasana, who was a wheel-turning monarch. And his palace and this place was the center of a worldwide kingdom, prosperous, well-populated, a kingdom of justice. And the streets of this Mahasudasana's kingdom were full of the sounds of elephants and carriages, of gongs and commerce, of cattle and symbol and joy and prosperity. And from here in every direction stretched great roads north and south and east and west. And so I will die in this place that has been the center of Mahasudasana's kingdom. Why is this in the story? Reflect for a moment. What could this mean? I love this. Because what it says is that any place and every place can be the center of justice can be the kingdom of righteousness. Every place is the still point of the turning world, the place where Dharma can be awakened. It may have been a muddy crossword in a crossroad in a primitive and undeveloped area with simple huts. But the Buddha said, if you could see as I do, every place is sacred. And this is a holy place that in its time has been magnificent, but every place in its time is magnificent. Even now, if you only have eyes to see. And finally, one last visitor comes and another says, no, 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 the blessed one is sick. And the Buddha lifts his head and says, no, he may ask the last question, let him in. The teachings of the blessed one are open-handed to all. And the last visitor asks a question, and the Buddha points him to the noble path of wise understanding, wise thought, wise action, not harming, right livelihood, right speech, right action, and the development of mindfulness, compassion, wisdom. And then he looks to everyone around and says, I have shown you the way. Does anyone have doubts? And everyone is silent. And he says, I've taught you the way that leads to liberation, the way of virtue, of living with integrity and causing no harm to yourself and to other beings. I've taught you the way to quiet the mind and open the heart. I've taught you the great wisdom that releases you from the separate sense of self and opens you to timeless liberation, to what is called the sure heart's release. And as people were quiet there listening, he went on, then be of good resolve, all of you, O nobly born, remember who you really are, your own true nature. And he said, if you practice wisely and rightly, 
The earth will never be free of enlightened beings. A beautiful teaching. If you practice wisely, this earth will never be free of awakened beings. And he went on finally. Remember, all things that are created are impermanent. All that arises passes away. You must be a lamp unto yourself. Or as Mary Oliver says in his po- her poem of the Buddha's last days, make of yourself a light. Become the illumined one. Become the awakened one yourself. And see with the eyes of freedom and wisdom. In this passage from another poem of the Buddha, I consider the position of kings and rulers as that of dust motes in a sunbeam. I see the treasures of gold and gems as but broken tiles. I look upon the finest silken robes as tattered rags. I see the myriad worlds of the universe as small seeds in the great Indian Ocean as drops of mud that soil one's feet. I see that, perceive the teachings of the world to be the illusions of magicians. All the worldly teachings are but illusions. I look upon the judgment of right and wrong as the serpentine dance of dragons and the rise and fall of beliefs as but traces left by this four seasons. I rest in the timeless and awakened heart that has seen them all. I rest in peace. And with that, then the Buddha, there's a whole description of him entering the deep states of samadhi and inner well-being beyond the sick body that he was in and being released from this life. Make of yourself a light. All things change. All things are impermanent. This is the truth. This is the reality. And you have within you this capacity to awaken, this gift, your own true nature. Trust it. Practice with it. Awaken in it. Live in it the great heart of compassion, the freedom that is who you really are. And this is the end of the story once upon a time as it began, this great myth. And then it ends with these words. That's how it was in the old days and how it still is with us now. I kind of feel like I do when I'm putting my grandson Desmond to sleep and he's three and a half years old and I've told him a long fairy tale. And he says, Baba, tell me some more. And I tell a little more of the fairy tale. And then he's smiling and he starts to get ready to go to sleep. This is a beautiful story that's been told for 2,600 years. And part of what makes these myths and stories so important is that they speak to a part of our own heart and understanding that reminds us of something outside of the events of politics and confusion and all the things that are happening in the world which we need to care for and tend to, just as this text started, to treat each other, to listen and come together in harmony and listen with respect and care for the vulnerable. We need to do all those things. But then the Buddha says, here's a, here's a deeper invitation for you. Here's the mystery, because remember, it's not just the Buddha who's going to die, my dear friends. As Miss Piggy would say, moi? Me too, all of us, is saying yes. So then in the end, what really matters 
Yes, you tend, you love, you care. And you look deeply and see that you are the awakened one, that you are consciousness itself. You are loving awareness. And from this place of freedom and well-being and peace and compassion, you tend the world beautifully. Oh, and by the way, Mara will visit you regularly. So as Thich Nhat Hanh said, you might as well invite him in to tea and say, oh, is that you, Mara, again? Oh, my God, you see me. You know who I am. Here's a little tea, says Thich Nhat Hanh. But he also says, let Mara have tea. Respect him. Say thank you for doing your job. But don't have him stay too long. So I'm checking in to see if there's anything more for tonight, whether I don't feel like doing questions somehow after this long story. And I could have you speak and say what touched you in it, because there's a beautiful reflection to do. What part of this story caught your attention most? What place in the story do you feel like, oh, yeah. This is this reminded me, this was important, this touched me. Because it is alive in you. And you can sense and know that. 